Welcome to Bulls Head Bookshop. We're glad you're here today. Um, our guest today is Keenan Eminent Professor of English here at UNC and is co-editor of the Literature of the American South and the Southern Literary Journal. Her most recent books are The Queen of Palmyra, a novel, Wishing for Snow, a memoir, and The Woman in the Red Dress, Gender, Space, and Reading. Today she's with us to share from her new book, Remembering Medgar Evers, Writing the Long Civil Rights Movement, which is on sale today here at Bull's Head for 20% off. Please help me welcome Ben Rose Gwynn. Hi everybody, thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate it uh, coming out today. I know there are a lot of things going on and uh, thanks a lot uh, for being here. Um, I'm, I'm really, I'm really excited about talking about uh, this remarkable man, um, uh, Megger Wiley Evers, and uh, the writing that he's inspired up to the present. And uh, so I'm going to divide my comments into two parts. And first I want to tell you a bit about Megger Evers, the man, and talk about the implications of his form of activism for us today. Can you hear me back there, Liz? Okay. Uh, how his lifelong but understated struggle for social justice raises large questions about the nature of heroism and leadership and its meaning for us in the present. Um, as Aaron Henry put it in 1964, a year after Evers' assassination, in a very poignant letter entitled, Dear Medgar, he says, Medgar, when you fell, you fell forward, covering the full six feet and two inches of your body. You carried us that far down the road to freedom. And then second, uh, I want to acquaint you with some of the writings and songs that have kept Evers' memory alive in an age of forgetfulness. I want to address a statement Toni Morrison made in an interview with Bill Moyers several years ago in which she says, there's some things in culture only artists can do, and it's our job. And that's just the way she said it with the emphasis on the last part. And I want to think about how art can create cyclical releases of collective memory that address not only human rights issues of one time and place, but that have resonance for social action in our present and our future. So first, Megger Evers is a man and a leader. Uh, over the course of this project, I spent a lot of time in archival research, especially in the Evers' collection at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. And uh, as I read through poems, memorial flyers like this one, this is a memorial flyer um, uh, for one of the many, many, many hundreds of memorial services across the country for Evers, um, and scores of, uh, of thousands of condolence letters Evers' widow Murley received after her husband's assassination, all of them moving and many beautifully written, this statement kept popping up. Megger was a man with man more often than not written in all caps or in italics. And one literary example of this is Margaret Walker's poem, Micah, in which she compares Evers to the vociferous Old Testament prophet. She ends the poem with the line, Micah, meaning, meaning nigger, was a man. Uh, of course, this is an echo of the placards of many, um, that many Southern uh, African American activists um, carried in demonstrations that said, I am a man. But I think it's also a statement about Evers, or repeated again and again, um, and this statement has something to say about the quality of his leadership. Uh, so I want to talk about that um, a bit. Most accounts of Evers as a man begin with, his detail, with the details of his cold-blooded political assassination and the three subsequent trials of his killer, white supremacist Byron Del Beckwith. A good example of this emphasis is Marianne Bowler's book, uh, Ghost of Mississippi. Some of you may have uh, seen that. And then the controversial film that uh, is by the same name. Such accounts tell how Evers, only 37 years old at the time, was shot in the back, just below the shoulder blade, as he unloaded a stack of t-shirts imprinted with Jim Crow Must Go out of the back of his blue Oldsmobile, a little after midnight in the driveway of his modest home at 2332 Gine Street in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and this is a picture of his house now. Uh, it was refurbished for the film with the furniture, most of the furniture or kind of furniture that was in the house originally. 
and uh, it, you'll notice that um, there's a door there on the side of the house instead of a door in the front of the house. Uh, the Evers uh, had that put, uh, had the house constructed in that way so that um, they could slide through the passenger side of the car directly from the carport into, uh, into the house uh, so as not to uh, present a target uh, from, from the outside. This is a rule, though, that Evers broke the night that he was shot. He was bending over the trunk of his car in, in the driveway getting these t-shirts out uh, at mid around midnight. Um, how his wife, then 30 and pregnant, and the couple's three young children came running out to find him um, mortally wounded in a puddle of blood on the carport. How he was laid on a mattress and put into a, a station wagon by neighbors and taken to University Hospital where his own physician, Albert Britton, wasn't allowed to treat him because he too was African American. Evers' last words uttered, uttered as he lay dying on his carport were, turn me loose. In fact, it was often said that Evers, who was by nature a mild-mannered, patient, but determined man, and whose duties as the NAACP's first field secretary for the state of Mississippi were mostly behind the scenes, was worth more to the movement dead than alive. After his very public burial at Arlington Cemetery, his widow and children's visit to President Kennedy afterward, and the initial ex explosion of outrage resulting in demonstrations for racial equality around the country. Um, the, uh, there, there are a couple of pictures here that I'd like to see. Uh, one of Merle Evers in Life Magazine, and you can enlarge that. Jamila, do you, do you know how to enlarge? Oh, that's the, yeah. Um, can you? Okay, sorry. Uh, well, I think you can see it well enough. Uh, it's it's an iconic picture of Marley Evers comforting her son at the at the one of the funerals uh, for Medgar Evers, and then there's the funeral procession picture um, in Jackson. There were thousands of people who had, who attended uh, his funeral in Jackson, and uh, actually many of them were arrested after the funeral for supposedly. Uh, uh, rioting uh, when actually they were simply uh, walking in the streets. Um, more largely, Evers became a martyr whose death ricocheted throughout the 60s in the assassinations of other strong human rights and civil rights leaders. But this is only part of the story of Maker Evers. His lifelong struggle for social justice and his everyday life in the white supremacist state of Mississippi in the 1950s and 60s has received less attention. His is a very local story, a story of place. In her well-known comments about location and place, Eudora Welty says that location is the heart's field as well as the crossroads of circumstance. Evers' heart's field was his home state of Mississippi. And there's another picture here of Evers in front of a, um, a, a um, sign of Mississippi. Can you see? It's kind of blurry, but, um, um, and with the exception of his service in World War II, he lived there his whole life. In his last year, refusing the NAACP's offer to relocate him and his family to California because of uh, threats, threats to, his, uh, to their lives. This, he said in an interview called Why I Live in Mississippi, is home. The things I, that I don't like, I will try to change. On a personal level, Evers was devoted to the land he was born in and his father farmed as a sharecropper. He liked to fish for bass and grow prize plums on a tree in the backyard. He had a dog named Heidi. Yet this land he loved was a quagmire of violence and injustice. For Evers and the other activists involved in the state's arduous civil rights struggle in the spring and summer of 1963, the seething state capital of Jackson had become a mire of tension, violence, and horror within a police state, which many compared to Hitler's Germany. And this is very common rhetoric, by the way, among civil rights activists and leaders to liken um, Mississippi and, and many other parts of the Deep South as, as um, fascist concentration camps, uh, uh, Hitler's Germany, and, and um, Nazi a Nazi state. Um, 
demonstrating adults and children were being shoved into reeking garbage trucks and incarcerated in livestock pens at the state fairground, Mississippi's concentration camp, as Merle Evers called it, becoming the butt of racist jokes by bigoted newspaper columnists. Mayor Alan Thompson had just asked city voters to approve a bond issue of up to a million dollars to build more detention facilities to hold uh, racial demonstrators. Participants in the Woolworths lunch counter sit-ins, including Tougaloo Southern Christian College student Ann Moody, one of the writers I'll be talking about in a minute and I write pretty extensively about in the book, were frozen in place on the covers of the nation's newspapers, their condiment splattered bodies hunched in self-protection before an angry white mob. Um, And um, just, I, I want to thank um, Jamila Dallas here, uh, who who worked with me on this project, and the research that you did on Ann Moody was really, really important to this book. So, thank you very much for for that. Uh, a copy of a boycott of white-owned businesses had ratcheted up the rhetoric of racism from city officials. Um, Jackson, Mississippi, uh, in the poem by, of the same name by local poet Margaret Walker, was a city of tents and stricken faces, city of closed doors and ketchup splattered floors, city of barbed wire stockades and ranting voices of demagogues, city of squealers and profane voices hauling my people in garbage trucks. Danger was nothing new for Evers, who had put his life on the line for years. After serving in a segregated army unit on the European front in World War II, and while he was employed by the Magnolia Life Insurance Company in Mount Bayou, Mississippi, Evers, under direction from the NAACP, he was by then an active member, had made an unsuccessful attempt to enter the University of Mississippi Law School in 1954, and later helped James Meredith accomplish that goal eight years later in 1962. He'd been beaten for refusing to move to the back of a bus in Meridian and arrested for holding leading and holding demonstrations. In his role as field secretary, he had supported and or organized economic boycotts and lunch counter and library sit-ins in Jackson and voter registration drives throughout the state. He was constantly being harassed by police as, as well as threatened, threatened being threatened by, by big, bigots. His, Method was to fly under the radar. Wearing the clothes of a field worker, he made dangerous trips on backcountry roads to rural communities around the state to investigate instances of, um, of racial murder and mayhem for the NAACP. Interestingly, we think of leaders of the civil rights movement oftentimes as marching in the streets and giving dynamic speeches. At least that's the popular, uh, I think, portrait of many leaders of the civil rights movement, and certainly rightly so. But much of Everest's time was spent incognito, or behind a desk writing reports to the national organizations and news releases uh, to the press. Uh, and so this is a very uh, important picture for me, this next one, um, because it shows him with his, uh, his, his manual typewriter there sitting there, and it looks like he has one of those reports in his hands, having just pulled it out of the typewriter. He spent a great deal of time uh, doing this, and it, he was actually, uh, he, I, I'm gonna say this in a minute, so I won't say it too strongly here, but he was actually an author himself, I think. Um, there's a new book, fairly new, in the past couple of years that came out, um, edited by Manning, Man Mirabel, I'm sorry, I always stumble over that for some reason. Um, Mirabel and uh, Merle Evers Williams, it's called the Autobiography of Megar Evers. And um, when I saw that, I was kind of in the middle of my project and I thought, the Autobiography of Megar Evers, how could I have missed this? But it's a compilation of um, all the reports and speeches that he, he gave, even though he didn't give that many speeches, but it's in his notes and, and, and so forth. Uh, and, and it struck me as that, and in, in Mirabel and, and Evers Williams say this as well, that, that it's appropriate to call this his autobiography because this was his life writing. Um, deeply located in place, um, 
a Mississippi and a South ever insisted on laying claim to as his and his people, he was a man of what I call plural singularity, in the sense that he was a community member as much as a leader and a rock solid worker whose behind the scenes tactics inched the Mississippi movement forward incrementally, but sometimes almost imperceptibly. He was a leader without bodyguards or police escorts. He wasn't one for grand speeches, though he could speak eloquently um, on occasion when he decided he was going to write a speech. He was more often than not alone in dangerous situations. He blended in, standing alongside the people even as he led. At home, he answered his phone and patiently argued with racist crackpots on the other end of the line, much to his wife's consternation. Um, and uh, just to uh, want to give you a little bit about the situation in the Evers home. Um, when they would come in at night, um, they would um, sit on the floor uh, and instead of sitting in chairs and, and on the sofa in the living room because uh, they were afraid of drive-by shootings and there had been fire bombs thrown into the house and so forth, into the carport, not into the house. Um, and um, they had, they put the refrigerator up against the back wall, uh, uh, the back door of the house, so that uh, that, that door would be barricaded. Uh, they had instructed their children at the, at the sign of anything to drop to the floor, crawl down the hall to the bathroom, and get in the tub. Um, and Merle Evers, in her autobiography for us, The Living, says uh, on the night before Evers died, we just sat there on the floor and held each other and cried. So in a state where almost all the newspapers, including the black-owned uh, Jackson Advocate, were in lockstep with institutions of oppression, Evers not only cultivated reporters from other places and seems to have thought of himself uh, as an underground resistance fighter through his own investigative narratives of injustice, he also started the weekly uh, Mississippi Free Press with its masthead, The Truth Shall Make You Free. And I just wanted to show you some of these, the headlines of some of these newspapers. This is the white-owned Clarion Ledger. It and the Afternoon uh, Daily in Jackson uh, were owned by the uh, notorious Hederman brothers who uh, were members of the White Citizens Council and probably also um, KKK. Um, you'll notice that uh, this, is, this is the um, paper that came out when um, Beckwith was arrested. Both of the pictures there are of Beckwith. He's very natally dressed. He seems relaxed. Um, and um, the interesting part about this for me was their assertion that uh, Beckwith was a Californian. Uh, Beckwith was born in California, but he actually lived almost all of his life in Mississippi and came from an old Greenwood, Mississippi family. So, uh, and at the time was a fertilizer salesman in Greenwood. So, uh, he certainly was not a Californian at all. Uh, of course, the the um, the word on the street was always, oh, those outside agitators are coming in here and stirring up trouble. And uh, so they wanted to depict uh, Beckwith as an outside agitator in that sense. Would you hit it again? Okay, this is the Jackson Advocate. This is a, this is a fascinating newspaper for me. This was the most interesting newspaper that I looked at. Um, it, was, it, it had a whole lot of news in it about um, Africa, about um, other parts of the country, and so forth. The editor, Percy Green, though, was, um, he was a, uh, he, he was against everything that Evers was for in terms of specific goals. Segregation, uh, he, integration, um, he was, he, he never even wrote a uh, newspaper uh, editorial about Evers's death, and he also um, he published for the White Citizens Council and the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission uh, some of their flyers and, and news news bulletins and so forth and so on. Uh, it's, and but the Jackson Advocate presented news of the outside world for for blacks worldwide. So it, it was an interesting, interesting here. Um, 
and you'll notice it, although the masthead says that Evers is shot to death, um, the story itself is buried down here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is this this part that you see is the only part that's on the front page. It's jumped all the way to to the back page uh, after that. So it's it's a it's a uh, it's interesting. It's an interesting uh, publication to look at. And scholars of of journalism and communications have really scratched their heads over Percy Green and what he was thinking. Um, and then there's the Mississippi. Free Press, a diminutive tabloid that Evers and um, other civil rights uh, activists um, published. So this is a picture of uh, Beckwith um, uh, uh, on the front page of it as well. Um, as Merle Evers would later write in her memoir, For Us the Living, he placed himself between the wounded, the beaten, the frightened, the threatened, the assaulted, and the white racist society that invariably had its way, everything its way. Would you hit another slide, please? He investigated, filed complaints, is, issued angry denunciations, literally dragged reporters to the scenes of crimes, fought back with press releases, close quotes. These writings of his indicate that he himself was a storyteller whose outrage boiled up off the page as he recounted the struggles and persecutions of his people. And again, I think this picture is very telling. Uh, it's very fuzzy, as you can see. I found it um, in, in a pile of other fuzzy pictures. But what he's, what he's really doing, is these are young demonstrators, and he's talking to them to try to get um, one of his jobs was to try to bail these young people out of jail. The NAACP would send the bail money down, and he would, then he would uh, he would try to go down and bail all these these young people out of jail. And uh, and so he's and there's some more uh, of these demonstrators, young demonstrators, standing uh, behind them. But he's talking to the man with the bandage, uh, and probably asking him, you know, what happened to you? Tell me about it. Hearing and retelling. Hearing and retelling testimonial stories of violence, he set the gold standard for accuracy and fullness of memory in the face of willful forgetting or misremembering. He took pictures of mutilated bodies, including that of 14-year-old Emmett Till, and he called news reporters in the middle of the night to alert them to crime scenes. As Merle Evers describes, he felt keenly his responsibility as, an, as a witness to those quote, is what she called unsung heroes and heroines in Mississippi. The Emmett Till case is, of course, one of the most notorious lynchings of the period. What isn't so widely known is the story of how Evers, in his relatively new role as NAACP field secretary, he'd just taken the post toward the end of uh, 1954, and, um, and uh, Till's uh, body was found um, in late August um, 1955, so he hadn't been in the, on the job for very long. Um, he worked exhaustively on the Till murder. When Evers, who had he just investigated the murders of two local voting rights leaders, George Lee and Lamar Smith, found out about the Till case, he called for help from the regional uh, NAACP uh, office, and officials from there joined him in dressing in overalls and beat up shoes and bandanas, and examined and photographed young Till's mutilated body, filed reports to the NAACP, and tried to convince members of the black community to become legal witnesses to the crime. As field organizer Howard, Howard Spencer, who helped Till with the Till, helped Evers with the Till investigation, declared in a 1968 interview, "Quote: Had it not been for Megger Evers, it would have been just another case that's been forgotten. The Emmett Till case was the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott. It was the beginning of a lot of incidents in the South that began to make the Negro aware that he would have to get out there and expose himself to these racists, to these people that were going to kill him." There's one case, an obscure one, and a picture that goes with it that epitomizes the kind of man and leader Evers was and the kind of writing he did. So would you? Um, and I'm just going to read Evers' report to tell you the story of, of this picture. In December 1955, Evers begins his report entitled, Killing of Clinton Melton, Negro, by Elmer Kimball, White as follows. 
Saturday night, November 3rd, 1955, was another night of terror in the county of Tallahatchie in the town of Glendora. An innocent Negro man, World War II veteran, father of four small children, ages five, from five months to five years, and husband of an attractive wife was shot to death by a white man. And this is a very long report. Uh, it goes on for, for quite a few pages. Uh, and in it, after recounting the story of the white man who pulled a shotgun and blasted Clinton Melton in the face for filling his car with too much gas, Evers continues. The four children, Dolores Melton, five years, five years, Clinton Melton Jr., three years, Vivian Melton, two years, and K Kenneth L. Melton, five years, were left fatherless by this fiendish killing. Close quotes. Evers ends the Melton report with a poignant statement. For him, he writes, the experience shall be of long memory. Historians Renee Romano and Lee Rayford have observed that civil rights history more often than not has been rendered in terms of exceptional individual action in the moment rather than long-term community activism. That the long and exhaustingly hard work of local organizing and everyday jeopardy and sacrifice, the kind of work Medgar Evers was known for, hasn't been fully narrated as part of the civil rights past. At bottom, Evers believed in collective action on the local level. He was a mediator between local activists, many young, like the ones you just saw pictures of, and the more conservative national NAACP office. He wanted leaders of other civil rights organizations like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to come into Mississippi and help out, while the national office did not. Manning Mirabal has called him a, quote, servant leader and likened him to, and these are Mirabal's words, nearly invisible and underappreciated women servant leaders of the movement, close close, who practiced transformational leadership by leading through example and dedication, thereby inspiring others to become involved in political activity. Mirabal points to the fact that in, in, I'm quoting him again, in most standard textbooks of African American history, Evers is either barely mentioned or completely ignored. Even in memoirs and commentaries by veterans of civil rights struggles, Evers barely merits attention. And then Marable adds that only a modest body of literature and film has kept Evers' legacy alive. Others, including Evers' widow and his recent biographer, Michael Vincent Williams, and I'm very happy to say that there's a brand new, uh, last year I think it came out, a biography, um, uh, of Megar Evers, it's, it's this thick and it's very well documented. And I told, I told Michael, I said, gee, you know, I really wish I had this when I was doing my work. It would have saved me a whole lot of time. Uh, but it's a very good biography, very thorough. Um, they both agree, uh, Mrs. Evers Williams and, and Michael Williams both agree that um, uh, Evers hasn't gotten the attention that he richly deserves. Tell the truth, you never knew who Megar Evers was, the contemporary hip-hop group Dalit Raps. Uh, this is an effacement, if not erasure, noted time and again by Merle Evers Williams. In an interview with me two years ago, she said that aside from raising her children, her major priority in life has been keeping her husband's memory alive, because she knew if she didn't, quote, he would have been forgotten within one year of his death. One year. And she tells a story about uh, giving a talk at a local um, uh, institution um, uh, and uh, of higher learning, uh, a traditionally black institution of higher learning, and walking around campus and running into these students. And she stops and, and says, "Do you know? Did you know? Do you know who Megar Evers was?" And none of them, none of them knew who he was. And one of them said. Um, one of them said, gosh, you know, is he a, is he a pro basketball star? And uh, she tells this story in a very poignant way, and I, I think, you know, and, and to make her point that um, Evers, uh, she feels her husband has not gotten his, um, his place in history yet. Um, this is a picture of her, though. Uh, I think that's changing, though. I think all this is changing. Um, and um, this is the uh, U.S. Navy ship, uh, the Maker Evers, which was uh, christened by her uh, last year. 
and uh, these are her surviving children behind her. So um, I think I think uh, things are, are changing, hopefully. So how indeed should we remember Megger Evers as the one in the many, and where should such remembrance lead? Uh, Evers' legacy also turns us to resonant questions about what Jacqueline Hall and other uh, historians of the civil, right movement, civil rights movement have envisioned as a longer, harder civil rights movement, a more complex, ongoing movement that reaches up into our present and our imaginings of the future. If collective memory is a practice, an act of imagination and interconnection, one question that follows is how historically and imaginatively imbued memories of the civil rights movement that emerge from American and African American history might also shape a broader sense of collective relation and responsibility to global issues past and present. Many of our civil rights leaders of the 1950s and 60s, interestingly, including in, in, including Evers, interestingly, um, have um, had an, an expansive sense of the power and scope of the movement. Um, Evers himself was deeply influenced in early manhood by the African freedom struggles. Um, they understood they were living in a remarkable and transnational historical moment of alternative political imagination. In our own times, how we remember the civil rights movement in all its complexity casts light on other human rights struggles and failures and helps us see them in their particularity as part of a larger whole. In this sense, the concept of an ongoing civil rights struggle illustrates Kelly Oliver's belief that, quote, we need to find the conditions of the possibility for justice, for the impossible to become possible in the future, in the past. So remembered, um, Evers' lifelong struggle for justice pivots us to the future, linking us to these other struggles, both local and global, and helping us to see them as part of a longer, larger, more complex history of human rights struggles. This is why his legacy matters, or at least one important reason why his legacy matters. As the closing lines of Gwendolyn Brooks' poem, Megger Evers put it, Roaring no raft arise to the dead, he leaned across tomorrow, People said he was holding clear globes in his hands. It's been a half century since Med Grabbers died on his driveway. One way that he leans across tomorrow is in the substantial body of aesthetic production uh, that, have, that has reflected on and memorialized his life and death. Um, and this memory work, I think, uh, is, is really complicated in some ways. Um, um, and I'm interested in the relationship in the book. I, I, I do a good bit of writing on this about the relationship between artistic production, history, and memory, and how complicated it is. And just for an example, um, would you? Um, this is uh, some of you have seen this picture in my office. It's by Jackson, Mississippi folk artist Carl Dixon, and um, this is a wooden portrait of Evers. Um, Carl Dixon carves his pictures, figures of African American heroes from memory, but that memory is fed by other aesthetic objects of memory, parades, sculpture, photographs, stories. Um, and you'll notice, you know, just by looking at the pictures of Evers and looking at this picture, that uh, this picture doesn't look a whole lot like Evers. Um, in Dixon's hands, then, uh, memory is chiseled into stone. Um, he didn't take a photograph, you know, and, and, and this, is from, this is from memory. Uh, in the hands of um, uh, the writers whose work I discuss in the book, historical memory becomes story in this, in this uh, similar kinds of way, and, um, and memory becomes, uh, uh, moves into other works of imagination. It flows out into these other works of imagination. So in a sense, it's self-perpetuating. Um, so what I uh, argue in the book is that uh, historical memory needs writers and artists and musicians. Aesthetic labor is made necessary because the traumatic past doesn't just vanish from the individual or collective or national psyche. Even if forgotten, especially if forgotten, it still haunts us. It carves out um, its own locations, its own heart's feel. It has an afterlife. Historical memory is a flawed and messy thing, but it doesn't go away just because we might wish it did. Art, memory, performance, writing bring us face to face with the human dimensions of traumatic history. The civil rights movement of Evers' time is a story of triumph and a story of trauma. 
these aesthetic acts of memory, the carving of these faces into the wood or page or musical notes, confront us with the complexity, the multidimensionality, the tangled messiness of history. This is memory's function, to put a face to history. The labor of art is to make us imagine that face is our own. When we forget the past, we also forget part of ourselves. As Frank X. Walker's poem, Heavy Weight, says of Evers' home state, if Mississippi is to love her elephant self, she needs a memory as sharp as her ivory tusk, with as many wrinkles as her thick, thick past. So literature, song, and film of the past five decades have imagined and reimagined this thick, thick story of Evers' life and death, and his Frank X. Walker's stunning collection of poetry, Turn Me Loose, the unghosting of Medgar Evers, attests so eloquently today the writing continues.